Welcome to Lutheran Church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Why don't you turn my mic on? Let's try that again. Good morning, St. Luke's Lutheran Church. Good morning. Good morning, St. Luke's Lutheran Church, everybody watching online. Welcome on the Sunday. This is the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, a few announcements before we begin. Uh, blessing of new drivers for the peace to our 945 worship service will happen next Sunday. So if anybody here or anybody online wants to help us bless brand new drivers in the community, please come to the football field next Sunday. On October 4th, after the worship service on the football, well, during the worship service, I should say, on the football field, we'll have the installation service for yours truly. So if you want to be part of that, it comes to that, you may, Bishop uh, Regina will be preaching and leading at the service, which will also be another treat. Uh, Roger and Karen O'Reilly wish to announce their the celebration of their 50th wedding anniversary, and an open house for that is scheduled for December, or sorry, September 26th from 2 to 5 p.m. at Trevor and Charlotte Bokwin's house. Contact the office if you need more information on that. Um, due to COVID and for individual preferences, they welcome folks to drive by and honk their horn in appreciation of their 50th, uh, 50 years of marriage. So make sure your horn, horn works if you're going to go go to that. Um, also, starting on, on the 4th, on Sunday the 4th, our church is hosting a harvest food drive. Um, there's going to be information put out by, by Kelly, our outreach lead on how to participate, but basically we want non-perishable food items brought here, either to St. Luke Lutheran Church, before the 4th or on that Sunday, or to the football field on the 4th for us to then take down to the, uh, to the food shelf. Um, let me see. That seems to be... Oh, I have one more. I am looking for somebody in the church who would like to be a Sunday morning tech person who will help us set up and make our online service as, as vibrant and robust as possible. It doesn't have to be a person with experience in tech. It just has to be somebody who's willing to tinker around and learn and try new things a little bit. If that's you, contact me at my email address or call me. My, my information is online. That is everything for today. Uh, let's join together in prayers and ready our hearts and minds for worship. Lord God, we thank you for this Sunday, the Sabbath day of rest. Especially in a busy time such as the fall when the fields are being harvested or prepped for harvest. Equipment is being used for harvest or prepped for harvest. Guide us, Lord, to draw back and bring the things from our week into this day to hear how you would guide us more closely with you and more fervent love for our neighbors as we begin our week on Monday. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. 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 Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 
on him. Together we confess. Most merciful God, we confess, we confess that we are captive, captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned, sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by, by what, what we have done, done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. <coughs> Friends, God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ might live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. May be seated. We join together with to be your presence, number 526. <laughs>
Almighty and eternal God, you show a perpetual love and kindness to us, your servants, because we cannot rely on our own abilities. Grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and the Lord. Amen. But Eve, over for our reading. The epistle reading is from Philippians chapter 1. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Jesus Christ when I come again to you. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw that I had, and now hear that I still have. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please sing. chapter of Matthew 1 verse in Matthew 19 to hear Peter's question that precipitates a parable from Jesus Christ teaching us something unique about the kingdom of heaven. Peter answered Jesus, we have left everything to follow you, what then will there be for us? Jesus replies, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These lads worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me, or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you. I invite everybody to be seated. At home, if you are standing up, go ahead and take a break. Let's see, Eve, I'm going to give this to you because you're doing more work with this over there. Okay. Yeah. 
Children's sermon today, and I know the people here, you are children, well, at heart. You have to do this too. Deal? Okay, okay. We're going to play a little bit of a little bit of Simon Says. And at the end of Simon Says, I'm going to award points. And kids, if there are kids watching online now or will be watching later, pay attention because these points are going to be for you, okay? Everybody ready? Okay, shake your hands out a little bit. Okay, Simon Says, Simon Says, just pat your head. Okay? Stop. Oh, I think I got Harry. <laughs> oh, I got Joanne in the back. Just me and Pat are left. <laughs> okay, watch at home. Simon says, rub your stomach at the same time. We can do this so you can see it. Oh, I got something here. Simon says, stop. Start again. Simon says, start again. Oh, if you started and I didn't tell you, you have to sit down and you lose. Simon says, you don't have to do this now. The few people are done. Thank you. Because we're going to jump. Simon says, jump up and down. Time to stop. I know there are kids at home that stop because kids always stop on that piece. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to hand out awards. Okay? And I think, um, let's see, who here? Was it Dave in the back did, did the best? So Dave, you get 100 points. Catch. All right. Dave got 100 points. At home, honor system, if, if you did the best, I'm throw you 100 points at home through cyberspace. Catch? Now that means everybody else didn't win, right? But this is church, so we're also going to give everybody else 100 points. Eve gets 100 points. Thank you. You didn't see that, but you caught 100 points. Debbie gets 100 points. Debbie caught 100 points. Joanne gets 100 points. All right. Pat gets 100 points. And everybody at home gets ready. Cyberspace catch. 100 points. And you might ask, of course, is that fair? <clears throat> what we find out in the gospel lesson for today is that the landowner, who, because landowners over the years, Jeremiah and Isaiah, they always represent God, so we, we assume it represents God as well. He's not interested in giving 50% of what he has, or 20% of what he has, or half of what he has. And he's also not super interested in when people came to his vineyard to work and be with him. He's not interested in how broken and battered they might be when they come to his vineyard to work and be with him. What he's interested in is are they there? And if they're there, they get everything he has to offer. And what's funny is that at the end of the story, the only folks who are upset about that are the folks who feel like they worked harder and should get more. And that's a very understandable feeling. Because most of the time you think hard work equals heavy work. <laughs> Jesus tells us today the kingdom of heaven works different. This is a relationship where God never gives half of himself, half of his love, half of his forgiveness. When he gives, you get it all. So kids, you can take those bonus points. Is not only bonus points from Pastor Eric, but understanding that when God gives himself to you, he gives all of himself. And it doesn't matter when you go to him, whether you're a child, middle-aged, or even heading towards the next chapters of life. We're going to close with prayer. And again, if you're watching online, we're going to do prayer the way I like to pray with kids. Hold your hands out wide and shake your fingers. And I'm going to say, let us pray. And on prayer, we're going to clap. Let us Father, we're used to transactional relationships. We're used to relationships where we give out and we give something, get something back equal in return. We're good for Santa Claus, so he brings us Christmas presents. We're good for, for our remote lawns, so our neighbors give us money and salaries during the week. Lord, help us remember a relationship with God doesn't work like that. And when God gives himself, he gives all of himself, not because we've worked hard for it, but because he is good and he is gracious and he has so much to give. In Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Amen.
So if you were either worshiping here last Sunday or at the football field, you heard me ask a couple of questions that I then asked you to take home and talk about with your families at the dinner table that night. Who did that? I did. <laughs> at home, did you do that? Today I have more dinner table questions, and I will post them after the service on Facebook sometime later today if you can't remember them. It's important to take what we hear in church and talk about it at a dinner table so we remember that things that happen in church aren't just about church, they're about life as a whole. The thing I want you to think about and maybe talk to somebody about tonight or sometimes this week is I want you to think about one transactional relationship you have and why that transactional relationship is important. First question might be, Pastor, what is a transactional relationship? A transactional relationship is very simple. It's a relationship that we're in in order to get something from somebody else. It's a relationship that person's in with us in order to get something from us. For example, over the last three weeks, I developed a transactional relationship with the young women who work at the country store that sell coffee early in the morning. <laughs> There's a reason for that. That's the only place in town, early on Sunday morning, I can get a cup of coffee. And I don't like making my own coffee. And so on Sunday morning, at about 6 o'clock, the country store opens at 6 o'clock. I drive to the country store. And my relationship with the fine young people working in there is simply, I want them to give me coffee. Their relationship with me is simply, they want me to pay for my coffee. I want something from them. They want something from me. I'm sure they're wonderful people, but we just have a transactional relationship at this point in our life together. And transactional relationships are good for things like buying goods and services. But they're bad if we move them to areas of our life that they shouldn't be. If we make something like a friendship into a transactional relationship or a marriage into a transactional relationship or a parent-child relationship into a transactional relationship. Many of us can think back to a time when we were kids, if, if we had the trampoline in the neighborhood, or the basketball team, or the pool table in our house, and, and how many kids came over to our house only to play with those things. And, and we knew maybe at our gut level that this wasn't real friendship. Sometimes there were kids around us just because of, of what we had. And that happens when we're adults, too. Maybe you're the person who's got the really nice basketball. Or you're the person who has a really nice space and barn for events and weddings. And deep down in your gut, you know there's some people who are in relationship with you for those things. But that transactional relationship is masquerading as a non-transactional relationship called friendship. When that happens, we run into trouble. Now throw transactional relationships out of your mind for a moment. The next thing I want you to think about, and name it in the head, name one of the best non-transactional relationships you've ever experienced. A relationship that you've been in with the other person you can trust. They love you at your worst. They love you at, their, at your best. They are working for your good no matter how well or how poorly you work for their good. When I think about that, my mind immediately goes to parent. I had wonderful parents, I still do. And I think of the way that, that, that they love my brother. I think of my own relationship with my kids. That, that even when my kids say, Dad, you love Mom best, because kids say that, it doesn't change whether or not I, I give good gifts to them, whether or not I love them. That when the day comes and my, my Sunday teenage kids say, we hate you, Dad, because you never let us do A, B, or C, I hope with all my heart that doesn't change how I relate to them, and whether or not I continue praying for them, thinking about them, and giving them all the good gifts that I can give them. My own father used to tell me, he would always say, Eric, no matter what you do, you can always come home. And I thought that was the essence of a non 
transactional relationship. No matter what you do, this space, my life, is always open to you. Now the reason we're talking about this difference between transactional relationships and non-transactional relationships is specifically because of Peter's question that he asks Jesus today that starts off this whole parable from Jesus about a landowner and a vineyard who pays all these workers even though they're the same, even though they start at different times of the day. Peter asks Jesus, Lord, we have left everything for you. So he tells Jesus, Lord, look at what we've given you. And then he asks, what then will there be for us? Now by asking that question, is, 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 what is Peter showing Jesus? Is he, is he showing that, that he understands his life with Jesus, his life in the kingdom of heaven, is based on a non-transactional relationship, a relationship of love, love and grace and gifting? Or is Peter thinking that his, his life with Jesus, his life with God, his life in the kingdom of heaven, is based on some sort of transactional relationship? <clears throat> to me, the answer is obvious. If, if we say to anybody, hey, I have done all this for you, what's in it for me? We're telling that person, we have a transactional relationship. I work hard. Now, what do I do? And think back to our friendships that might have been transactional. What happens when we turn a non-transactional relationship into a transactional one? That's a whole lot of discipline. Now, Peter's response, or Jesus' response to Peter is wonderful. This is the second week in a row. Jesus has responded to one of Peter's questions with a parable. This is an awesome way that Jesus responds to help Peter understand how the kingdom of heaven works and how his relationship with Peter and other people work. He tells Peter this parable where a landowner goes out to, to, to hire people for his vineyard. And in Jeremiah and the book of Isaiah, the landowner of the vineyard is, is, is oftentimes seem to be, be God, so we imagine that this, is, this says something to us about God, how God treats us and other people. And you know the story, the landowner hired a day shift, the first shift, and said, I'll pay you one denarii, which is a day wage, and that's fair. And he went back in the afternoon and got a second shift, and he said, you know, I'll pay you one denarii, a day wage. And then he goes to get an evening shift full of people, and he says, one denarii, a day's wage. At the end of the day, everybody's gathered in front of the landowner's manager to get their money. And everybody gets the exact same amount. And this is super frustrating for the people who thought that they worked harder and that they should get more. Jesus' point to Peter is clear. If, if you hope that the kingdom of heaven works on transactional relationship rules, you're going to grumble. You're going to be disappointed. This is not going to be a happy experience for you. According to Jesus, the kingdom of heaven works quite differently. If you come early, you get all God has to offer. If you come late, you get all God has to offer. A child baptized at, at a baptismal font doesn't receive 50% of grace. Doesn't receive grace in a savings account or trust to see if later they've earned it, they can draw from it. That child, in that moment, before they can ask for grace, before they can merit grace, before they can even understand what grace is, receives 100% of God's grace. Someone who's divorced three times, if they go to the Lord at 40 years old and say, I don't know how to do this. I keep messing up. Help me. They're not told, well, you didn't get it right when you were little, when you came to me early. So I have a little bit for you, but not much. That person hears the words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, just like the rest of us. Not 10% of grace. Not 20 all of it. Grace is not like pie, where if I get a lot, you don't get enough. Grace is more like the ocean, where we can go and scoop buckets and buckets and buckets and throw it on the beach, and God blesses that water and just keeps coming rushing in to fill the hole. This is grace. 
Grace isn't a wage that we earn by doing well, although oftentimes we wish it would be. In fact, when we think of grace that way, we run into the danger of objectifying other people in order to get God's grace. You can tell me if, if this is a pet peeve for you. It's a, it's a pet peeve for me. Have you ever had somebody do something kind for you, but you can really tell it wasn't for you? I would, they, what they were really doing was something kind so that they felt better about themselves or so that they could score points with God or maybe somebody else. And when it was all over, instead of feeling served, what you really felt is used. I had, when I was a, a, a young, poor college kid, I had not much stuff and a small space to live in. And, and I met a lady who, who I, she, she seems like she felt guilty all the time of not doing enough. And she had all this furniture. She said, you need my furniture. I'll give you my furniture. And I thought, I don't, need, I don't want the furniture. I have a small little space. I can't take all of it. And she said, Here's, go, go to my house and get this big wardrobe. It wouldn't even fit in the door. And after a while, I thought, this, this isn't a gift for me. This is a gift for you. You're going to feel better after all of this. But that's what happens to us when we think of God's grace and God's relationship with us as transactional. We start using other people to make those transactions. And as Martin Luther said, it's not God who needs our good gifts. It's our neighbor. God is good. He's not waiting for something from you. He has something to give. Your neighbor does, though. Our neighbors need our gifts. We get in trouble when we turn what's supposed to be a non-transactional relationship into a transactional relationship. Now, Jesus' point to Peter is quite clear. God's relationship with us is non-transactional. He's not trying to get something from us. God is trying to get us. Think again back for a moment to, to that best non-transactional relationship you've ever experienced. Maybe it's with a mom or a dad. Maybe it's with a little child, a grandchild. Maybe it's with a special friend. Maybe it's with a really gracious spouse. Someone who has loved you at your worst, who has loved you at your best, whose love for you has never depended on whether or not you earned it. You were simply there to receive it. That person embodies what Jesus is saying today about God. That person's relationship with you is better than a thousand sermons on what grace looks like. That person is the embodiment of grace. And we thank the Lord for putting such people in our lives. Now the final point we have to notice today in Jesus' parable is this last piece that we touched on just a little bit. For any of us who hope or want our relationship with God or other people's relationship with God, especially people we don't like, to be, enough, to be transactional relationship-based, we're bound to be disappointed like those first ship workers in the parable. If, if, if we say, God, look how hard I work for you, how much I pray, how much money I give to the church and other things, how I try to be nice to people I hate, and we say, why don't you make my life easier because of all these awesome things that I do? That shows we are working like Peter was, on a transactional relationship expectation and our ability to see God actually beyond simply what we get to make us comfortable, secure, and happy is limited. Because we've told God we're only going to be able to see what we feel like we can earn. And it works in the opposite way as well. Not for those for us when we feel like we haven't heard it. When we say, Lord, I know that deep inside I'm not good enough. I know I don't pray enough. I know I don't work hard enough. I know I don't think enough about you or do enough nice things for other people. And we say, is that why my life is hard sometimes? Is that why so-and-so got sick? Is that why I got sick? Is that why this happened to my child? Is that why those things happened? Are you punishing me? Again, if we do that, we're falling into transactional relationship thinking. 
And we miss the fact that, that suffering and pain and sin don't signify an absence of God's work. Those are the places where God draws closer. We believe that it is best work where? In Jesus Christ, in the death and suffering of his own son on a rock called Golgotha. Non-transactional relationship thinking sees God's gifts and God's love even in the midst of such pain. My people, it doesn't matter how we arrive in the kingdom. If we come in early, if we come in late, if we come in with chinks in our armor, broken, broken, battered, or bruised, when we get there, we get all of God has to give. God doesn't know how to give anything other than all of himself. May we be mindful of that gift when we walk into our own relationships, especially our relationships that are not supposed to be transactional. Our relationships as, as parents to children, as grandparents to grandchildren, as husband to wife, as wife to husband, as child to parent, as friend to friend. We get in trouble when we make what's supposed to be a grace-filled, non-transactional relationship. Transactional. But we have an excellent model of how we're supposed to be. We have God's relationship with us, God giving 100% of himself to us in Jesus Christ, even in sin and suffering and death. May we take that model and apply it to our own relationships. And in such a way, live in authentic relationships of love and care. That is God's gift to us. May it be our gift for those around us. Amen. 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 I invite everybody to please stand. Our hymn of the day is number 605. Forgive our sins as we are forgiven.
justice wins. Let us pray. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Generous God, you make the last first and the first last, where the gospel challenges the church, equip it for the works of service, strengthen those who suffer for Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sun and wind, bushes and worms, cattle in great cities, nothing in creation is out of your concern. Mighty God, in your mercy, tend to it all. Give us the spirit of generosity toward all that you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Where we find envy and create enemies, you provide enough for all. Bring peace to places of conflict and violence. Inspire leaders with creativity and wisdom. Bless the work of negotiators, peacekeepers, development workers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Reveal yourself to all in need, and as you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing, accompany judges, lawyers, victims of crime, and those serving sentences. Give fruitful labor and a livelihood to those seeking work. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Even beyond our expectations, you choose to give generously. Grant life, health, and courage to all who are in need. Shelter all who are vulnerable in body, mind, or spirit, especially the family of Dan Dickey, Millie Bitson, Brad Roshan, Zach Graveman, Naomi Berland, Neil Stenland, Natalie Benrude, Donald Hadley, Kyle Ponsolet, Nancy and Donald Nord, Dean Kirkland, Marlene and Lloyd Roshan, Finley Budenzeek, Lauren Brown, and Carl Tomford. Take their yoke upon you and ease their burdens. Lord, in your mercy, in hear prayer. our prayer. We, pray, we praise you for the generations that have declared your power to us. Give us faithfulness to follow them, living for Christ, until you call us to join them in joyful song around his throne. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Today may the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Take some time to share a socially distanced peace with somebody near you. You can do an air five, sign of the cross, or you can throw a gold Peace, everybody. I invite you all you need to be seated for our doxology and our offering prayer. <coughs> uh, let me jump in really quick. Thank you, Debbie. I'm sorry. Um, as, as, as our offering goes, we invite everybody at home to prayerfully reflect on think on how the Lord might be giving, guiding you to give as well as those here, um, understanding that it is your gracious gifts that continue to help us do our good work in, in the town of Good Hue and beyond. Thank you for your consideration, and we can continue with our doxology.
revealed to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed our duty, our right, and our joy that on this day we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opens to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs and angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. As you peel the lid off of the juice or wine, here again this promise received in any way, shape, or form communion is received. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. May we pray together as Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. 
invite everybody to please stand and receive the blessing. Today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you with grace and with mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn is, I Come With Joy.